You're about to see an excerpt from our teaching on the tabernacle. It's called Secrets of the Holy Place, the life-size tabernacle. Now, we're coming toward the conclusion of our teaching. And so I would suggest to you that you pay attention to this teaching, then stay tuned at the end of the program to see an offer that I have for you. But this, this teaching is not only prophetic, it is also practical, and it will teach you something I believe that you need to know. Let's go to the service right now. Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author, Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Amazing prophecies that are concealed in the menorah is going to be the subject that we're getting ready to deal with. Exodus 37, verses 17 through 20, and we're going to add verse 23 in here. Follow me carefully. He made the candlestick of pure gold. Of a beaten work, work made he the candlestick. His shaft, his branches, his bowls, his knobs, his flowers were of the same. Six branches going out of the sides thereof. Three branches of the candlestick out of one side thereof. Three branches of the candlestick out of the other side thereof. Three bowls made after the fashion of almonds in one branch, a knop and a flower. Three bowls made like almonds in another branch, a knop and a flower. And a flower so that throughout six branches going out of the candlestick. And in the candlestick were four bowls made of like almonds, his knops and his flowers. And he made seven lamps. The seven lamps, of course, are on the top. And his snuffers and his snuff dishes of pure gold. Now the snuff dishes were to extinguish the flame so that they could put the oil and change the wick. That's what that deals with there. Now there is a great prophetic meaning behind the menorah. And the menorah has several different traditions behind it. There's two things. Number one, it's the symbol of the tree of life. In all of Judaism, the menorah symbolizes the tree of life. Number two, for some reason, they believe the menorah symbolizes the burning bush. And let me just say something. You've heard me talk so much about the acacia tree that was used for the wood. It is more than likely 90% sure that the burning bush was a small acacia tree. And that's the tree that would be used to create the entire tabernacle down the road. So God spoke to Moses from a bush that was burning that would have been the same tree used to make the Ark of the Covenant. So this is interesting. First of all, seven branches and seven lights on top. Seven lights. Now, seven, as you know, is a biblical number. Seven is such a number of complete completion and a number of perfection. But I want to show you something. I'm going to show you how, how uh, let's, let's look at this. The spelling of is Israel in Hebrew is Yisrael. I'm not going to give you the Hebrew letters, but I'm going to give you the English letters. Y-I-S-R-A-E-L. Yisrael is how you say it, all right? Then, if you look at that there are seven letters in Yisrael. The Y, the I, the S, the R, the A, E, and L. Again, I'm not giving you the Hebrew letters. It gets too complicated for folks. So seven letters in the Hebrew name Israel, translated, of course, to our language where we can understand it in the English language, seven. Now that's the seven-branch menorah. The seven-branch menorah is connected to the whole nation of Israel. That menorah was for all 12 tribes. Now look at Jerusalem, J-E-R-U-S-A-L-E-M. How odd is it that Jerusalem has nine letters connected with it? And those nine letters can represent the Hanukkah menorah, the nine branches of the Hanukkah menorah, because Hanukkah was not just about Israel. It was about the temple in Jerusalem. The entire story deals with the temple in the city of Jerusalem and how it was re-cleansed and the oil affected the menorah that was there in the temple. Now, again, if you want to, we've, we've, we've already dealt quite a bit with uh, the menorah itself, we've dealt with uh, it made of 100 pounds of gold. It was beaten out of one piece. The miracle of how it is able to stand, how originally it had a three-legged base here. So all of that we've already discussed. We won't rehash that. But there, there are some, some things I want to show you about the number seven and how it fits into the menorah. Now, what I want to do is I want to go, take you to the book of Genesis, and I want to show you the first in our Bible, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We got about a 9, 10 letter in English statement. In the beginning, God created the, created the heavens and the earth. Now, in Hebrew, I'm going to give it to you in Hebrew, and I'm going to put the number of the letter on top of it and then show you in English what it means. 
First phrase, Bereshit in the beginning. Bera created. Elohim, God. Look at, look at letter four. Aleph Tav, no translation. Then, Hashamayim, the heavens, Vechat, and Ha'aretz, Ha is the in Hebrew, Retz means the land, Ha'aretz, the earth. Please notice the Aleph Tav. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. If this were Greek, it would say Alpha and Omega. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, the Aleph Tav is the fourth in the series of the seven letters. If this were on the menorah, the Bereshit would begin on the left side and go all the way across to the seventh light. But it is the fourth light on the menorah, that would be the olive top. Why is that important? Here's why that's important. Because if you look at these branches, this middle one, watch, one, two, three, four. It's number four coming from one side. Watch this now. One, two, three, four. It's number four coming from the other side. It's four in both directions. But it is in the creation statement, the fourth letter. Bereshit, Bera, Elohim, Aleph Tav. And you've got uh, Aleph Tav, now remember, it's right here. This is the middle branch. And you've got Hashamayim, and you've got Vechat and uh, Ha'eretz. Why is that important? Because the Aleph Tav is all through the Old Testament, but it's never translated. When you come across it in the Hebrew scroll, it actually, Aleph Tav is placed there to place the emphasis on the coming statements or, or to tie it together and place the emphasis there. However, rabbis have noted this and Messianic Jews have really noted this. If you take it from the menorah, it would say, in the beginning, God created the Alpha and the Omega. For in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And Jesus said, I am the Alpha and Omega. If he were speaking Hebrew, he would have said, I am the Aleph and the Tav. I am the beginning, and I am the end. So in the very first statement of the seven words of Genesis that represent the menorah, you have in the fourth statement, I am in the beginning, God created Aleph Tav, saying, in the beginning, God created the Word, and there was nothing but the Word in the beginning. And the Word is Jesus, who is the Aleph Tav in Hebrew. And by the way, it's the fourth branch on the menorah. And guess what? This branch is called in Hebrew the servant branch. None of the other branches are called that. This is the central shaft that holds everything else up. And the Bible says he's upholding all things by the word of his power. Now that shows you a little bit about the number seven. So let's look at this, the, the, the days of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth, with, earth was without form and void darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Let's just stop right there and tell you what liberal scholars have noted that they mock Genesis with. God is supposed to create light on day on that first day, right? Genesis 1, 3. Go to your Bible and you'll check out that the sun, moon, and stars are not created till day 4. Now they say, how can there be light without the sun, moon, and stars? For the sun is the light of the entire creation. Therefore, we have a contradiction here. Oh, we got a contradiction in the Bible. Really? I decided to go to Jerusalem and ask Rabbi Getz. Rabbi Getz, you know, this is one of the, this is one, number two of all rabbis in Israel. What was the light of Genesis 1-3? I said, sun, moon, and stars were not created till day four. He said, that's correct. I said, so what was the light? He just said, it was God. Now, not only does John say, in the beginning was the Word, but if you keep on reading down from there, it says, and in him was life, and this life was the light of men. Now, John is going to refer you back to Genesis 1 and 3, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. 
That's Genesis 1-3. Now, what's interesting is in creation, I wish I could go through all this menorah and show you man is on the sixth day, God rests on the seventh day, and show you the first 1,000 years of history, second 1,000 years, third 1,000 years. But see, the sun was created on what day? The fourth day. And it is the light right now of all natural creation. So the sun becomes the servant which shares the light with all of creation. But if we count years, this represents 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, and 7,000 is the 1,000-year reign of Christ. So this menorah is 7,000 years of history. Just so happens that the servant branch is number four, representing 4,000 years, and from the time of Adam's creation till the time that Jesus came is exactly 4,000 years 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. Here's 4,000. Servant branch, Jesus the servant who became the light of the world, who upholds all things, shows up on the 4,000th year of creation from the time of Adam. It's all, it's, all, it's all encoded in the menorah. Anybody want to go a little bit further with this? Come on. Let me ask you a question. A lot of you have heard this. How many of you, though, at this point have not heard the menorah teaching? Raise your hand if you've not heard me do this. Hold it up real high, real high. Look, look around, guys. That's why I'm teaching like I'm teaching right now. Praise God. All right. Look at the seven churches of Asia. Let's look at this. Seven churches. Now, Jesus in heaven, I turned to see the voice that spake with me. John's on the Isle of Patmos, has a vision of Jesus. Being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. In the midst of the candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to the foot, girded about the paps with the golden girdle. And uh, so he's standing in the midst of the candlesticks. Then the Lord says to him in Revelation 1 and 20, I want to tell you about the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the seven angels, and that actually are messengers of the seven churches. This would actually be the pastors. You know, God loves preachers so much he calls them angels. Well, I can't help it that you didn't think that was a revelation or something. Yeah. And the, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Now, let me give you the seven church orders. We're going to go with the menorah. Start over here and count with me while I count this. Okay, here we go. We're going to start on the side where I'm standing. Number one, Ephesus. Two, Smyrna. Number three, Pergamos or Pergamos. Number three, Thyatira. Number four, Sardis. Number uh, 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 let's go over this again. See my numbers. I'm going ahead of my numbers. Number five, Sardis. Number six, Philadelphia. Number seven is Laodicea. I think I got them all in there, right? Seven churches. Okay. Everything starts centering, as we can see, on this center branch. There's your key branch. What is the fourth church? The fourth church is, uh, some people call it Thy 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 Thyatira. Others call it Thyatira. Scholars call it different ways. And in the fourth church... Here's what it says. The Lord, whose eyes are like fire, speak to the church. He mentions fire on this fourth church, which is the light of the menorah and his eyes. Did, have you ever looked at somebody's eyes? Do you know what eyes are shaped like? Almonds. Do you know what is on top of this? The almond blossom. Do you know what's on Aaron's rod? Talk to me, somebody. So God liked the almonds so much, he put your eyes in the shape of two of them. Look at it. Look at it. Look at an almond. Don't go sticking an almond in your eye like a nut. But look at an almond. Fourth church, he mentions his eyes like fire. And eyes are in the shape. They do. They have a shape. If you look at an almond, they have the shape of an almond. Some eyes are bigger than others. We know that. Some people also the same. Now, let me talk to you for a moment about a few more other things about the prophecy and the menorah. We're almost done with this. The judgments of the book of Revelation. What I want to show you is how God's patterns are just so perfect. The seven trumpet judgments of Revelation 8 and verse 2. Let us again start on, the, on this side. We're going to start on the side toward me and count the judgments. I'll give you the, the number, then I'll tell you what they're about. Ready? First judgment, which represents the first branch on the menorah, hell, fire, and blood from heaven. Number two is a burning meteorite. Number three is a star called Wormwood. I'll skip number four. Number five is the star that falls from heaven or angel with the key to the bottom's pit. Number six are four angels that are loosed. And number seven, 
the, the angel cries, it is finished or it is complete. That's why we talked about 7,000 years and you get to the end of that millennium. That last branch is the 1,000 year reign of Christ. What happens when you come to the end of the millennium? That's the end of it, man. We get, we're in eternity. So the seventh angel says it's finished and it's done. Now, do you know what the judgment is of number four, which is the servant branch? It is the judgment of the darkening of the sun, moon, and stars. Now, I've already told you. The sun is made on the fourth day. Look, this could go so deep, I could spend two hours on this, and I won't. But this is so deep, it keeps going and going and going. I'm only giving you a highlight to show you the greatness of the patterns of God. All right? The seven vile judgments. Revelation chapter 16. Let's go the same way. We're going to start on the left side, and we're going to go to the right side. Here we go. I said, did I do that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're going to come on this side right here, on this far side near me. First judgment, a sore appears on men with the mark. The second one, the sea becomes blood. The third one's the river becomes like blood. I'll skip the fourth one. That's the servant one. That's the main one. Number five, darkness on the kingdom of the beast. Number six, the Euphrates River dries up. Number seven, it is done. You always get to number seven in all of these. The seventh seal transitions to something. The seventh vial transitions to something. The seventh trumpet transitions to something. But always number seven is where it says it's done. It's finished. Complete. That's why, that's why the early church fathers said the, that there were six days of creation and God rested on the seventh. There's going to be 6,000 years from Adam at some point to the time the Messiah returns to set up that one thousand. God rested on the seventh day. That's a thousand year millennial reign of Jesus. That's why everything ends at seven. You don't see another branch on the candlestick in the temple. There's only seven because it's 7,000 years of total history. Oh, I wish I had time to preach on that. Oh, by the way, the fourth vile judgment is the sun scorches men with fire. Fourth day of creation, fourth branch, sun, moon, and stars are made on the fourth day. Fourth judgment, sun, moon, and stars. Fourth trumpet judgment, fourth vile judgment. Let's talk about seven feasts. Woo, this is what gets me excited. Hey, you ready? Some of you are going to shout with me before this is over with, all right? You're going to get that good Baptist method of shout on. You watch. I'll guarantee you it's going to come on you. This is really cool. Now, seven feasts of Israel. We've got to start from this sin. Ready? I'm going to come behind you like this. Ready? Here we go. No. Boy, I'm all dyslexic. My, my feast went backwards when I did that. Let me come here. Woo that was weird. It's like, all, it's like all of a sudden I got back here and said, what's the first feast? <laughs> Okay, here we go. Ready? Passover. You all know the seven. Watch now. Unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost. Ah, oh, you ain't heard it yet. Coming to the fall months, trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, trumpets, Day of Atonement, tabernacles. Those are your seven feasts of Israel. Why is... Pentecost, the servant branch. Why is it the... Why? Why? Because the Holy Spirit, represented by the menorah, came on the day of Pentecost or the feast of Pentecost to be, bring the Holy Spirit to build the church around Him and around Jesus. Oh, but wait, wait. Ready? And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like a fire. Yeah, there it is. Now you got it. Now you, come on, give the Lord a praise. Somebody give him a shout for the word of the Lord. All right. So, so the first, now here's what's interesting. You ready? This tabernacle that I've been showing you with all these curtains and all this furniture. Moses went up on a mountain for 40 days, but you have to count the time that they came out of Egypt. And then he's 40 days on the mountain. Add it up from Passover to the time Moses whew, came off of that mountain with those commandments was 50 days or the day of Pentecost. When he came off of that mountain on the day of Pentecost, Jewish rabbis have taught this for centuries, that fire was seen on the mountain. And the Bible says there was fire and lightning and all that type of thing. 
and that God spoke, God's voice could be heard in 70 different languages, which were the 70 languages of the nation. At the first Pentecost, we're talking about rabbis that don't believe in that speaking in tongues stuff. That's their tradition about Moses being on the mountain in Pentecost. Now watch, 3,000 souls. Okay, first of all, God comes down on the mountain. Jewish tradition says there are voices heard from the nations off the mountain. 3,000 souls die because they're worshiping a gold cow, right? Watch what happens in Acts 2 when the day of Pentecost is fully come. The Holy Spirit comes. Tongues of fire show up. They start speaking the languages of the nations. Sixteen Jewish nations understood those Galileans speaking their own language. And 3,000 souls are converted on the day of Pentecost. <laughs> Woohoo! Mm, my Lord! 3,000 souls converted. So here's what, the, here's what that central branch represents. Three things. Ready? Number one. The light of Pentecost or the light of the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost to baptize people. Number two, he brought the anointing, which is the oil. Every lamp had oil. Do you know what that means? Ready? The first thousand years, it's from Adam till the translation of Enoch. Every, I wish I could go through this and show you the whole thing. Every 1,000 years, God has people who have the oil the anointing. Every generation there's somebody. Maybe one person in France, one person in Spain, one person in the Middle East, somebody in the desert. But every thousand years, there's a generation of anointed people. But we're here right now. We're at Pentecost having fulfilled these feasts. Now we're at Pentecost getting ready to fulfill the rapture, which I think is a picture of the Feast of Trumpets. I don't say it's going to happen then. I think though it's a picture of it. Secondly, and it could happen then, let me correct that. Second day of atonement, which is the tribulation, and then the tabernacles, which is the kingdom where Jesus is going to come back to rule and reign for 1,000 years. So right now, we're living at the servant branch. Now here's the thing. Oil and light, the church has the light, and we also have the oil of the anointing. But I want you to notice, and here's the final part of this message, and I don't want anybody to miss this, servant branch. This is not just called main shaft, main branch or main dude. This is servant branch. And here's what it means. That when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit and you come into your individual Pentecost, you are going to serve God and serve people. Perry Stone is pleased to announce the release of his Secrets of the Holy Place Tabernacle series with nine new DVDs, approximately 16 hours of remarkable Hebraic insights and wisdom regarding the Wilderness Tabernacle and the Secrets of the Holy Place. Using a life-size replica of Moses' tabernacle, including intricate replicas of the sacred furniture, Perry combines 40 years of research on these nine compelling and powerful DVDs, giving you perhaps the most detailed revelation and exciting discoveries of patterns and mysteries you will ever hear, explaining the redemption code concealed in the tabernacle boards, curtains, pins, priesthood, and holy furniture. Preached before a live audience, the subjects include Living in the Shadow of God, Tabernacle Secrets, Amazing Insights and Messages Concealed in the Tabernacle Furniture, Secrets of the Priesthood and the Priestly Garments, Priestly Rituals for Spiritual War that Believers Must Follow Today, Holy Smoke, David's Tabernacle and the Shadow of God, The Blessings of Corbin and Prophecies in the Menorah, Christ Our Melchizedek and the Mystery of the Blood, the Sinai Code, the Festivals and the Concealed Mysteries of the Cross, the Believer's Royal Priesthood, Prophetic Insights, and much more. You will enjoy approximately 16 hours of uniquely illustrated teaching on DVD, which includes scriptures, important pictures, and other indispensable information edited into the teaching. Perry has never offered anything of this magnitude in the history of his ministry and is limiting the amount of time this special offer is available. This beautifully packaged nine DVD set, Secrets of the Holy Place Tabernacle series, is available for a special donation of just $135 or more, which will assist us in keeping the Manifest Television program on the air. Order now by calling toll-free 
1-888-21-BREAD. That's 1-888-212-7323. Or order online at perrystone.org. You may also write us at Perry Stone, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee 37320 and enclose your gift of just $135 or more and request offer 9DV001. We look forward to hearing from you soon. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you've been watching and you haven't ordered yet, this is the last week. This is it to get Secrets of the Holy Place, nine DVDs, 16 hours of teaching with a life-size tabernacle. We had seven cameras in there. I mean, you know, you, you're talking about taking a, 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 almost a year and a half to edit eight cameras with the scriptures, with the graphics, with the pictures from Israel. And so we believe it will be a great teaching. And you know, winter's coming up and this is where you wanna sit in your home, get your coffee or whatever, you know, your popcorn and watch this with your notebook and your notepad. This is the time to do it. Thank you, thank you also for those of you that have ordered the material. Now, uh, real quick, you know, Manifest is on the air. They tell me in hundreds of countries and providences, both on cable, of course in the United States, it's the States on cable, but on satellite around the world. And uh, just as a brief note, uh, we go into uh, nations where we are translated into different parts of the world, and we're seeing results among all the different religious groups. It's amazing when I meet people that are especially outside the United States who tell me we watch your program, we don't miss it, we use your material on Bible studies, in our Bible studies, and things of this nature. And so what I want to share with you is it's important that you help keep Manifest on the air, either through your support or through the support of like, the material that we show you. That's how you do it. We ask you also to continue to pray for us when we step out into some of the realms that we're stepping out into. And I think you all know this, this is, especially if you're believers. You make a lot of friends, but you also make a lot of enemies who don't like what you preach and don't like what you say. Now, we have never been intimidated to compromise the messages that the Lord has put in our heart to share with people. That is one area that the Lord has given me boldness. However, we also know that it takes a very, very heavy foundation of prayer. And we always ask people, when, when, when we come into your mind, you see our face and you think of us, the family or the entire ministry, keep us in your prayers that the enemy will be defeated, that we will stay strong physically, be able to accomplish everything. I guess my favorite verse in the Bible in the Old Testament, I just love this verse where it says that Joshua left nothing undone of what the Lord commanded him to do. And I, I guess if I had a prayer of mine, it would be that whether, you know, you live long enough and you pass and Jesus doesn't come or Jesus does show up, that you, uh, that you do everything that he has instructed or commanded you to do. So thank you so much for watching Manifest. Now we're going to be coming uh, to you very soon with excerpts from the main event. Thousands of people came. Uh, we had messages that the Lord gave us, so I want you to be looking for those on the program as well. And uh, also pray for our trip, which is coming up to the Holy Land, that we'll be able to tape and do exactly what God wants us to do. See you next week.